Good evening, everybody. Thank you for that second set of applause. It's really appreciated. Thank you so much. Good, good evening and welcome again to the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute. I'm Basil Smichel, Director of the Public Policy Program here. Um, I want to say uh, thank you to the leadership of both uh, this institute and of Hunter College. So to President Rab Howell Holzer, who we were in a discussion with uh, earlier but could not, could not stay. Um, I want to say thank you again for their leadership. I want to also thank Bianca, who was instrumental in putting this together. Thank you, Bianca. You'll probably see her later. Um, to uh, other folks on the staff here at Roosevelt House, Matt, our fearless photographer. Uh, thank you. Matt. Has anybody ever s introduced you, Matt, of all the events you've done here? No. Yeah. Well, and I'm the first. Look at that. Look at that. This, this is okay. All right. To the other folks on staff here, uh, Peter, Alexis, Danny, who is on the ones and twos. It's not a DJ booth. It's the ones and twos on the video cameras. Well, we'll get some, we'll get some turntables shortly. Um, Phil and Monica, who's back there, who is starting. This is her first event for us. So congratulations and welcome um, to Roosevelt House. For all of you here, Congress member Carolyn Maloney is here. Thank you so much for joining us. And the uh, former uh, borough president of the great borough of Manhattan, Ruth Messenger, is here. Oh, here. And, uh, and an instructor here as well. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, I um, have this, as you know, we do a lot of events here. But this one is really important to me and near and dear to my heart because I get to have a conversation with someone that I've known my entire political career, my entire career, quite frankly, in, in Ambassador Patrick Gaspar. So just a couple of things about who he is, and then I, and I, and I want to add a, a personal note. He is currently the president and CEO of the Center for American Progress, a leading public policy think tank, working to build an inclusive and just nation. Recently served as president of the Open Society Foundations, one of the largest private philanthropies where he shaped the foundation's $220 million commitment to civil rights groups in the wake of a national reckoning on race following the murder of George Floyd. During his tenure as the US ambassador to the Republic of South Africa, um, Ambassador Gaspard renewed the critical bilateral cooperation on security, health outcomes, and fair trade, and led the effort to redesign US HIV and AIDS funding in the region and integrate it effectively into the South African healthcare system. He served as the national political director for Barack Obama's historic 2008 campaign. Went on the lead in the, in the went on to lead the president's administration as the associate director of personnel, and assistant to the president and director of White House Office of Political Affairs. He was also formerly executive vice president for the Service Employees International Union, Local 1199, and. A graduate of Columbia University, where he has an honorary doctorate from there and Bard College. <laughs> Got it. He also, but beyond that, and perhaps really important for me as well, he's been awarded the Spring Garden Medal, the highest honor bestowed by the NAACP. Of a personal note, I met Patrick in 1996 when he worked for Borough President Messenger and I worked for the Bronx Borough President at that time, Fernando Ferrer, who was a CUNY trustee. Um, both were running for mayor in the 1997 mayoral uh, uh, Democratic primary. This was uh, ultimately uh, the, the year uh, Borough President Messenger uh, won and ran against Rudy Giuliani and lost. <laughs> What's amazing about that time is that because we were all doing events together, Patrick and I would run into each other ev absolutely everywhere in New York City. Every chicken and fish dinner uh, in every hotel in every part of the city, every Democratic club um, that you can imagine. We were running into each other trying to figure out who's going to get their boss to speak first. Um, but Patrick already had a distinguished career in politics because you had already worked for David Dinkins at that point, right? 
And so I already met, I met him as a seasoned political operative and just watching him work and watching him ascend in the way that he has. Not only is he one of the uh, most uh, intelligent individuals that I've ever met, um, he's also probably the most humble. And to be both brilliant and humble in our business is uh, a rare, is an ex exceedingly rare thing. And I thank you for your friendship and welcome you to the stage for our conversation today. Thank you so much for coming. We go back a ways. We do. We do. We do. We, I'll talk a little bit about that at some point. That was that was humbling. What? That was humbling. And you Bro, know, I'm humbled, man. No, no, no. I'm I'm incredibly humbled and proud to be here and uh, extraordinary to be in the company of someone, a number of people I've known for a really long time. Uh, uh, Congress member Carolyn uh, Maloney. We go back a ways, uh, and of course, uh, former Manhattan Borough President uh, and my Yoda, Ruth Messenger. So it's great to be with her. I, you know, you know, I'm recovering from a bit of an injury, so I'm not swift of foot, but I promise to try to be swift of mind uh, in this conversation with these exceptional uh, scholars. No today. doubt, no doubt. Now, we planned this event a couple of months ago. A lot's happened since then. A lot's happened today. <laughs> and I did, I, I, I did not want to, st I, in some ways I want to not have a conversation about it, but the reality is we have to. What? Donald Trump was, has been formally indicted. He has been arraigned today on 34 felony counts right? and is on his way back to Mar-a-Lago to give a speech tonight. We've heard from Alvin Bragg um, who, uh, who spoke with a little more detail about the rationale behind the indictment. Um, neither of us are lawyers, so I don't wanna go into the legal But we framework. always play them on TV. We do. We do, and I don't want to go into the legal framework here, but I do think it's important to, given your role, where you are, what you do, and what you have done, could you talk a little bit about what this means for the country right now? Happy to do that, but, I, but I'm going to do it with a big old caution flag up. Uh, you said that we have to talk about this. We don't actually have to talk about this. We're going to talk about this. Um, but I, you know, and I, I had this conversation earlier today. I had a, uh, I pulled together uh, virtually all of the, the staff at the Center for American Progress, and I said, so this historic thing is going to happen. Uh, a former president is going to be indicted. We've never seen anything like this, uh, but um, uh, this individual has busted through so many norms uh, that we already know what this is going to look like. He's going to manage to turn this into yet another performance. Uh, that will, you know, it's the politics of performance always trumping the politics of principle. That's what we've seen for years now. He'll turn this into yet another three-ring circus. He'll figure out ways to both um, uh, advance his own politics and to somehow commodify <laughs> the indictment <laughs> to make some money off of it. We know that. But let's also recognize that there are other pending charges against this individual. We've got an investigation in Georgia. We have uh, two federal investigations. There are other questions being asked in a number of other states. Those charges may prove to be a good deal more serious uh, than uh, the important uh, indictment that came down today. But between uh, hearings, uh, between uh, opportunities to litigate this uh, in court, we cannot allow um, this individual to completely dominate public discourse. Right? There is a feeding frenzy that exists in the media. Um, uh, Donald Trump and anything related to Donald Trump, they have figured out, puts fannies in the seats, sells tickets, gets them the, the, the social media uh, virality uh, that they are desirous of uh, in this new media ecosystem that we're in. Uh, and we have to work to deny that of them and deny that of him uh, at, the, at the same time. So we'll talk about this, in, this, uh, this indictment. We'll talk about him. But I'd rather pull back the lens uh, and look at the landscape of history and have the conversation from that perspective, particularly as we're now joined by Congressman Jerry Nadler, oh, who, 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 who really gets it. So, you know, I'll, I'll, say, I'll say this about Trump and the indictment. For, for a number of years now, some of us have been saying that there is no such thing as Donald Trump 2.0. What you see is what you get. The very first time that Donald Trump came to uh, was, was mentioned in the New York Times was 50 years ago uh, when he and his father were um, under a, a, a decree from the federal government because of the um, 
the racial discrimination uh, in uh, their, their, their housing contracts. Uh, very first time he ever got mentioned in uh, the Times and, and got any national prominence. He is that same person uh, that he was in 1973, 1983, 1993, 2003, 13, et cetera, et cetera. I sat probably as close as I'm sitting to you now, Basil, at uh, the White House Correspondents' uh, Dinner uh, in uh, the, you know, the infamous one where my boss <laughs> dropped the mic on Donald Trump. I sat about this close. I was at the next table over from Trump, and you could just feel the steam uh, coming off of him. He was just sitting there seething. Uh, and one understood, if you were in the room that night, that there's no way that that guy, that narcissist, there's no way he was not going to use the occasion somehow to fuel uh, his desire to get a little bit more attention and to run uh, for uh, national office. But I want to be careful about something about Trump and Trumpism, even as we think through this indictment. Donald Trump did not create the political environment that we're in right now. Donald Trump is an absolute savant, and he knew how to take advantage of the environment. He, he knew how to recognize that uh, 20th century media died uh, its death at around 2013, and the rest of us didn't recognize that yet. He knew that we were in this new thing, and he, he appreciated how it could metastasize hatred, that toxicity that he is damn good at, uh, and he took full uh, and full some advantage of it. But he also understood something else about the moment we're in in this country. For a long time now, uh, in the words of um, Ron Brownstein, uh, the um, uh, journalist and kind of quasi-historian, America has been both closely and deeply divided. By closely divided, we mean that all of our electoral contests are within a hair of one another. If you go back, one of my favorite states to look at to, to demonstrate just how closely divided we are uh, is Florida. I've spent too much time on presidential campaigns from uh, my first national campaign working for Reverend Jackson in 1988, uh, all the way up to President Obama's uh, reelect. I participated in every presidential contest as a staffer. Uh, can't hold me responsible for 2016 because I was in South Africa at that time. But if you, look at, if you look at every presidential contest going back to 88 through uh, 2016, and you, look, and you tally all of the Republican votes uh, for president in, in Florida, all the Democratic votes for president, the tens of millions of votes cast in all of those seasons, what separates uh, Republicans from Democrats is a cumulative total of 12,000 votes uh, in that one state over all of those years. Uh, there are similar numbers for states like Ohio and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, Michigan, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We are closely divided in a handful of states that determine the outcome of the elections. We're having this conversation in Roosevelt House uh, where the New Deal was struck um, uh, because, you know, there were badasses like Francis Perkins uh, who, knew, who, knew how to, who knew how to seize a crisis and understood how to, how to lead. But if you look at that Roosevelt uh, moment, uh, all throughout, uh, and you've got the 20th century, you will, you will see that America pitched from one moment to another where we had total control of our government by either Republicans or by Democrats for very, very long stretches, right? You had dominance uh, by Republicans who controlled everything in the 1920s. In the 1960s, Democrats controlled everything at the federal level and the majority of governorships in this country. That is no longer the country that we're in, and it hasn't been for some time now. Going back over the last five times now that a president in power has gone into a midterm elections with full control of the House and Senate, that president has invariably lost control uh, in their midterm elections. That was not the case for the majority of the 20th uh, century. If you look at the Reagan landslide uh, in uh, 84, uh, 80, uh, and uh, his reelect uh, in uh, 1984, despite Ronald Reagan winning all of those states, uh, you still had um, 100 and I think it was 191 members of Congress who were sitting in a district that was won by the, uh, by, by the opposing party. No longer the case here uh, in the United States today. That's down to like a dozen uh, or so. Uh, and it's also the case that when uh, um, uh, Democrats were dominant at the national level, Republicans managed to win key Senate states uh, and, and, uh, uh, and congressional contests because we had a ticket splitter phenomena. Again, no longer the case. Our elections now are kind of more parliamentary uh, elections in the, tw in the 21st uh, century, where people stick with their party, uh, and we have a kind of sorting hat that's occurred with Republicans and Democrats. We no longer have the kind of 
um, uh, Rockefeller Republicans. Uh, we we no longer have. Um, so George Pataki's not walking through that door anytime. No, no, he's not winning a, pr a primary inside of that uh, party anytime anytime soon. So you've had this kind of radical sorting hat uh, in both parties now, uh, and there's an inability to have dominance uh, in the electoral map on one side or the other. That's what we mean by closely divided. Now on deeply divided. Uh, there is a demographic existentialism that we are uh, going through uh, in the United States today. Uh, I can only compare it to, uh, historically, something that I learned as a young person following the, uh, the history of uh, South Africa, and you'll see where I'm getting with this. Remember as a young person when the Soweto uh, uprising uh, happened uh, in the mid-1970s uh, in uh, South Africa. Following that uprising, younger whites in South Africa uh, tended towards a kind of liberalism in their politics, uh, and they were arguing for rights uh, for, uh, for blacks in the country and for an opening of their society. The apartheid regime did this interesting thing in 1980 that was altogether uh, contrary to what they had done in the past. There was a decennial census, uh, and they released the data from that census. And in that census, they demonstrated to the white population that in a very short period of time, the percentage of uh, whites in the country would dip to below double digit. They're like, in 20 years, you're gonna be less than 10% of the population. We're just letting you know this. Why did they reveal that at that moment? Because they appreciated that that would lead to a conservatism uh, amongst uh, uh, whites uh, in the country uh, and would lengthen uh, the, time, the period of apartheid by strengthening their support for it because they would recognize that they had a demographic crisis. I remember, the census uh, in the United States uh, in uh, 2010, when all my friends were going on MSNBC uh, and they were saying things uh, like uh, demographics is destiny, uh, and they saw numbers that said, you know, in two decades, we're going to have um, uh, majority minority populations uh, in the US. That was being celebrated in some corners, but, but that news was being received in right. other corners Very with a little bit of anxiety, right? right? Uh, and the Donald Trumps of this world, and so many others uh, in that particular party, appreciated the anxiety that that uh, demographic reveal uh, would induce uh, in the population. And then you had to exploit that, particularly uh, in hollowed out former factory towns uh, in the Midwest of, of, of America. Uh, we're now in an America where if you go and you, you look at the, the data for public school students in Des Moines, Iowa, the majority of students in this public school system in Des Moines are children of color. Des Moines, Iowa, right? So that, that changes how, other, how the you know, older population in Iowa thinks about public goods uh, and services, thinks about what's available for their children and their grandchildren, uh, and it makes them a good deal more vulnerable and susceptible uh, to some of the arguments that are being made. And you so I gave that whole long-winded talk as a way of saying, look, the Donald Trump phenomena is not about uh, Donald Trump. It's bigger uh, than Donald Trump. It ain't going away, and there will be any number of other very talented uh, demagogues who are going to be able to take advantage of that demographic existential crisis that so many folks are uh, experiencing, unless some of us are able to th th take up the notion of inclusive economic advancement in a way that enables me to have the same conversation about the economy that I would have in a VFW hall in Columbus, Ohio, that I have with the NAACP chapter in Cleveland, Ohio. Now, you mentioned that this is, so in under, this is an issue that both parties have to wrestle with, or at least uh, are gonna be faced with. What are the challenges for Democrats going ahead, if, if any? Well, so so uh, I don't think it's a, it's a challenge that both parties wrestle with. I think it's a challenge that one party wrestles with. Uh, I think there's another party that's decided they're going to be in the mud <laughs> already uh, on this uh, issue. You, you, you remember after uh, President Obama won his reelection in 2012, uh, the then head of the Republican National Committee, Reince Priebus, uh, put out a, a forensic autopsy of the Republican Party yeah, that's right. and said, oh my God, we're in trouble. Yeah. We're never going to get the presidency back. We're going to be in the wilderness in the House uh, and in the Senate unless we reform ourselves find ways to speak to Latinos, some African-Americans, create diversity in our ranks. He went to Brooklyn. I remember he went to uh, churches yep, in Brooklyn. Yep. Yeah. And Donald Trump said, no, 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 not so much. Uh, I think there's a, another path that's available to us here, uh, and we can actually inspire people who have been low propensity voters 
uh, who are white, who are anxious, uh, and we can stir them uh, on uh, these issues. I remember uh, you and I are, you know, come out of elections, which makes us um, uh, data geeks. I, I remember when we won the 2008 campaign, uh, and the day after the election, I had nothing to do with my, uh, with my time. Uh, and so a number of us were sitting around and just kind of going through data uh, in a number of precincts around the country. And, and, and one of us had the notion that we should look to see, despite the fact that John McCain really got trashed, we should look to see if there were any places where he outperformed George W. Bush. We found a bunch of them. Where were they? Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee. So despite the fact that uh, John McCain got considerably less votes uh, than George W. Bush, in the Deep South, we were found in county after county where he actually outperformed uh, George W. Bush. I remember, I remember that moment. I had like, I have goosebumps thinking about it, and I thought, oh, if somebody's looking on the other side, looking at the same data that we're looking at, they may understand that there is a way to kind of agitate a different kind of performance yeah. uh, in their ranks. So right. I think that there's one party that's wrestling with that demographic uh, reality and divide, and another uh, that's run into the deepest, darkest recesses of the web and in our politics to, to animate it uh, in an altogether different way. For Democrats, uh, I think that there's an extraordinary moment that's available to us thanks to the hard work of Congressman Nadler, Congress uh, Member uh, Maloney, uh, Leader Schumer, uh, President Biden. With the passage of the infrastructure uh, mm -hmm. bill, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, the CHIPS bill, there's something like $1.6 trillion, $1.6 trillion in federal resources uh, that will uh, go directly uh, into states, into municipalities, uh, to, of course, make investments in uh, infrastructure, in healthcare uh, expansion, particularly rural uh, healthcare expansion, uh, and a number of other really critical uh, uh, fronts of infrastructure. But I think there's another important opportunity beyond the material opportunity. There's an opportunity here for Democrats slash progressives slash liberals uh, to take up the challenge of building up a, a proper economic narrative uh, of what it means uh, to have this kind of efficacy in government, uh, to center uh, the right communities uh, in, in, uh, in a way that takes up equity uh, in public policy making as intended by these brilliant uh, members of Congress and in a way that will land in rural West Virginia uh, as profoundly uh, as it will land in East LA. It's a unique opportunity, a profound challenge. I don't know if we're up to the task, but you know, some of us are working on that right now. Now talk about CAP because Center for I think American Progress. a game changer in not just public policy, but in politics in as politics. well. And so how does CAP fit into that? Center for American Progress, what, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, really, it's a big organization with tremendous reach. How do you, and you, you sort of touched on this earlier in terms of the role that the media plays in how we view, understand, uh, absorb information about our world. How does CAP, to whatever extent, cut through that? Or how do you, um, how do you engage the voter or the thought leader in the work that you do in trying to help develop those narratives? I love the question, but it's, it's making me like nervous. I'm like, oh I my God, it is a big place. It is a big <laughs> job. How do we do this? So I'll, I'll, I'll say this. One smart so, person at a time. No, no, no. I'll, I'll say this. So, so um, uh, I do like to believe that uh, the Center for American Progress is playing in a, a terribly important role uh, in uh, the ecosystem. Uh, I think that CAP turns 20 years old uh, this year. Uh, it was started by um, uh, it's extraordinary uh, figure with a lot of uh, support and energy from others, a guy named John Podesta, who knows a thing or two uh, about uh, policy making, about communications, about um, uh, what it means to properly invest uh, in organizing. Started 20 years ago with this notion that um, when, uh, when, when we, when the collective we, uh, are in power, we have to uh, figure out ways to use a uh, deep research, muscular advocacy, uh, and nimble uh, communications uh, to seize on a number of uh, ideas that are intended to take on the proximate challenges and to think a little bit uh, further uh, afield uh, as well. A uh, number of like, you know, key uh, urgent challenges that we have uh, in uh, our democracy uh, and to find a set of issues where the Venn diagram 
uh, enables us to, to figure out how we build majority uh, consensus uh, to get legislation done, uh, to move uh, administrative uh, bureaucracy in a way that accrues to the benefit of average uh, Americans, and to have all of that correspond to policy making uh, in uh, critical states as well. Now, uh, in year 20, uh, I keep telling folks that, yeah, all the work that we do across the suite of interventions that we're engaged in are all really, really, really important. Uh, and I'm proud to uh, help provide some leadership uh, to uh, staff members that are working on literally every frontline issue that you could imagine, from reproductive uh, justice to uh, labor rights to uh, access for the differently abled community, et cetera. I, I, across the board, we're engaged. But at the end of the day, I've told, I tell myself and my staff every day that if we're not thinking about small d democracy and working on lifting up scaffolding uh, around it, uh, then we are uh, losing uh, every day. Um, ca this moment is a different moment than the one that birthed CAP uh, 20 years ago. Yeah. Uh, we're living through uh, an information revolution, the likes of which uh, are just unimaginable. <laughs> it's, it's so funny, a few weeks ago, we were all thinking about um, the consequences of, uh, uh, you know, uh, beyond billionaire like Elon Musk uh, having control over a major social media platform and being able uh, at his whim to throw reporters on or off of it. That seemed like such a crisis then. Uh, and now we wake up a few weeks later uh, in a universe where um, machine learning uh, and artificial intelligence is actually a thing. This is not just something in some science fiction movie that we're watching uh, on Netflix. It is a thing that is in our lives, and it is a thing that is operating with absolutely no guardrails whatsoever, uh, a thing that we all just you know, are, are standing back as spectators, uh, as major corporations uh, vie over control of the technology and try to determine who's gonna leapfrog over whom to get the angel investors uh, to make a major buck uh, off of this thing. Uh, and you see congressional hearings, and I say this with, with respect and love and admiration uh, for the members of Congress who are here, but you see congressional hearings where our legislators are asking questions about the technology of 10 years ago and not the technology of 10 minutes uh, from now. So for me, this whole information democracy challenge is as existential a threat uh, as climate change uh, is, uh, and it's a challenge that uh, requires uh, transnational solutions. Last week, uh, President Biden convened um, a democracy summit. Mm -hmm. um, um, it was really nice to see Benjamin Netanyahu bend over backwards to like, pull away from his, um, his uh, abuses uh, of uh, the judiciary uh, in Israel just to be able to come to the Absolutely. democracy <laughs> summit uh, in the US. Not that I'm editorializing, but um, he held a democracy summit, and in the heart of the democracy summit, uh, President Biden and Secretary Blinken, I thought, lifted up some really important questions about uh, the direction of information democracy uh, in the world. Uh, but I think that even in that moment, we were in real time uh, failing to ask ourselves about the, the, the authority that we currently have to curb some of these worst practices. Right now, today, an average citizen uh, in Belgium has more rights and protections uh, from the abuses of Google and Twitter and Facebook than the average American does. And that's because of the lobbying industry and how it's like, you know, uh, determined uh, here, how it's determining outcomes in uh, the regulatory environment here in the US. So as I think about CAP of 20 years ago, with its overwhelming focus on uh, universal health care uh, in the US uh, and centering the care economy uh, more broadly, uh, as I think about uh, the agitation from CAP at the time uh, to exit out of um, uh, uh, the war uh, in uh, Iraq, which was a, a driving animating question. And I think about the CAP of today with the uh, increased growing disparities uh, in income, the opportunities afforded to us because of the passage of this unprecedented uh, legislation uh, and the way we've all been blown sideways by uh, uh, a media slash uh, information slash disinformation environment we're living in, uh, the cap of this moment uh, is looking to um, not uh, go it alone, uh, not to just be uh, in our silo uh, as a think tank, but to make sure that every single day uh, we are taking up the, um, uh, the ambitions of coalition, of grassroots partners, uh, up in uh, the halls of Congress, uh, and conversely, 
translating the limitations of congressional power uh, to our pragmatic uh, activist uh, partners uh, in a way that enables us to fine tune our ambitions. Uh, if, I can, if I can, I want to give you a quick example of the yeah, latter. A uh, few weeks ago, uh, I co-authored an op-ed with um, uh, some, some dear friends, uh, Rashad Robinson, who's the leader right. of Color of Change, right. Nick Turner, who leads the Vera Institute of Justice, uh, and we used the opportunity of the op-ed to ask the Biden administration a question that it was not asking itself. Um, we're not, uh, you know, this is, I'll, I'll pretend uh, that none of this can go outside of this room, so I'll, I'll tell you a little story. Uh, before the State of the Union address, I got a call from the Domestic Policy uh, Council and advisors of the White House. They wanted to make certain that as the President talked about criminal justice reform and talked about his desire to invest in 100,000 additional police officers in this country, that we would all be aligned. We weren't entirely aligned on the issue, uh, but during the conversation, it occurred to me that there are things that we could be doing beyond just calling for the George Floyd bill to be passed uh, that sit within the purview of uh, current administrators in Washington, D.C. Every single year, the Department of Transportation adjudicates hundreds of millions of dollars in grants that go directly from the DOT uh, to practically every police force in this country in order to do what? Incentivize the traffic stops uh, that led to the death of uh, Tyree Nichols. They ask a set of questions that basically uh, lean towards the fulfillment of quota systems in uh, these uh, cities and states. Uh, and I asked uh, the Secretary of Transportation whether or not it might not be possible for them to review their entire grant-making process to say, all right, maybe we can't get the George Floyd bill passed because we can't get support from Republicans, but maybe there's a way that we can disincentivize uh, these stops through the administration of these grants in a way that's not as sexy as getting a bill passed, uh, but pushes past bureaucracy uh, to save lives. Uh, and we're now in an active engagement with the secretary in a way that I believe is gonna get that thing done. So for me, like this whole way we think about our advocacy in this moment, uh, how we kind of uh, push past uh, bureaucracy in a way that is bold, ambitious, but speaks to the pragmatic realities of the limitations of power is a, is a conversation that I want to be in, particularly with the next generation of activists who are here uh, in this room uh, and in this university. So I want to um, definitely want to get a couple of questions from all of you, but, uh, but I want to do so, uh, some quick lightning round policy questions. No, I'm going to filibuster so you can ask less okay, questions. Right, right, you right, ask right, tough right. questions, man. Um, <laughs> so as an educator, um, and we are in an academic setting, and you mentioned Florida, all this Ron DeSantis uh, anti-critical race theory, anti-wokeness, but the effect, is there, is there, uh, are you concerned about the effect that he will have on um, how we teach young people in this country and across the country? I'm, I'm, I'm terribly concerned. You know, this is not just occurring uh, in Florida. There are already four states uh, that have passed laws that are akin to the kinds of things that we see moving out of the legislature uh, in Florida, and there are many others that are going to follow on the heels of it. I want to say very like, clearly and soberly, Ron DeSantis could, could care two cents about education policy uh, in this country. This is just a, a kind of, everything, every time they talk about education, it's a euphemism for a culture war, right? It's a euphemism for race, it's a euphemism for all kinds of stuff. Uh, that, um, that they're trying to use to rile up and animate uh, a core uh, base. Uh, but regrettably, it has real world impact on exactly education policy and curriculum, what our kids uh, can read and how uh, they uh, get to interrogate uh, history. You and I came up at a time uh, in uh, the, the public school uh, system uh, in America where uh, we have, made, perhaps we were, um, you know, I, I remember having some really interesting debates uh, as, a, as a young person about Christopher Columbus and all of these points of mythology uh, and origin uh, in this country, but those debates were available to me uh, and my generation, and I worry that we're moving towards a time where the opportunity for those debates and asking uh, those questions is being erased. So there's a responsibility that those of us who care about these issues have to take up these questions in a way that's not a direct response to the rhetoric of Ron DeSantis, but instead is a response to the concerns, the actual concerns uh, of parents who just wanna make sure that their kids have an opportunity to compete, 
get to the uh, the start of the race with, uh, with 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 some equal opportunity to complete the race at the same speed as other uh, kids, uh, and who understand that there are um, that there's real value uh, to diversity uh, and inclusion. All of the polls demonstrate that to us. We are on the side of the angels on this issue, and we have to speak not to Ron DeSantis, uh, but to uh, parents uh, in our cities and in our suburbs and in rural America. Uh, on these issues, and I worry that we're too eager to just kind of get into right. the pit war with DeSantis right, right. and we're not speaking to community. And related to that, as you talk about democracy and democratization, um, bills to suppress votes of certain communities and even the threats that are being made against some of our elected officials and public officials, um, how do you think about the role of public servants going forward and the role of the voter in um, in being able to access our democracy through some of these bills. Ah, this is such a tough one, and I wish we had five hours to, to talk about it, right? As, yeah, five as, minutes. As somebody who has, you know, I, I remember in, um, mm, I remember the, I remember crying uh, in um, uh, 2004, I was working on John Kerry's presidential campaign, uh, and I decided that I wanted to spend uh, the last week of the campaign, not in central headquarters, but instead down in Broward County in Miami. And I remember being in tears, uh, seeing uh, the seniors, you know, seniors, folks in their 70s, folks in their 80s, waiting four hours uh, online in Broward County. Uh, and then I would drive 30 minutes away from where they were waiting, uh, and other communities were just breezing in and out uh, and uh, had uh, easy access to our democracy in ways that folks like, who looked like me uh, didn't have. I remember the, the, the pain of that. Uh, and it, it's astonishing uh, all these years later, 19 years later, 20 years later, uh, to see uh, that right now in this moment, uh, if you live uh, in a majority white voting precinct uh, in uh, the state of Georgia, uh, you have uh, an average wait time of eight minutes uh, to vote. And if you live in a majority black voting uh, precinct in the state of Georgia, you have an average wait time of close to an hour uh, to vote. And that's average, because the, the numbers go like far higher uh, than that. Uh, and I think that there's just, um, it's an astonishing thing. It feels to me as if there's, an away, there's a way to organize and appeal around fairness in these places. Uh, I think that we have not managed the issue well. Um, and, and I would say, you know, as somebody who is a, um, a blue state Democrat, an unapologetic blue state Democrat, I think that we have set some very poor examples uh, in states where we have majority governing control. I think that New York, our state, is in the, in, in the Pleistocene period uh, where, where when it comes to uh, voting access and innovation and reform, uh, even in, you know, uh, states that... Uh, are not under any federal consent decrees. We have a tremendous amount of corruption in, in how uh, our uh, voting systems uh, are uh, managed, and things need to be done about that, and we need to call ourselves out and create accountability in our spaces. We have to take better advantage of technology that's available to us, uh, and uh, I also think uh, that um, uh, it's inexcusable uh, for us to I want to be really careful about what I say about things like the, like the filibuster, uh, but I think that there's a level of organizing that should happen in states like, I don't know, Arizona, West Virginia, top of, top of the mind, uh, to uh, create a different kind of conversation with um, our uh, uh, federal legislators who are in those states uh, about the rights uh, of all Americans uh, and what their constituents need and deserve. You mentioned uh, South Africa. The vice president just came from Africa. Um, the anti-apartheid movement was a defining movement of my childhood uh, and my young adulthood. Um, You're still a young adult. I, not according to my back. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, every time I get off the bed in the morning, okay, everybody, where are we ready to get off? Are we ready to go? Um, Got to make a plan just to get out to get out of bed in the morning. But that said. Um, um, you were ambassador to South Africa. I know you're still engaged in the country and in the region. How has it how has it progressed since we since that fight, since the anti-apartheid fight? And um, if you could talk a little bit about 
maybe you know your thoughts about the vice president's trip and the yeah. continent and the region in the future. So it, it, it pains me that uh, my knee surgery kept me from being part of the vice president's uh, delegation. I had the honor that she invited me to participate uh, in that trip. I thought it was an exceptional trip uh, to Ghana, Tanzania, and uh, Zambia. Uh, I think um, uh, the vice president did a, a thing that we often, you know, those of us who are Africanists don't always do well. Uh, at every stop in that trip, uh, she lifted up a set of uh, policies that would make it clear to the audience back home why it was important for us to be uh, investing in better health outcomes, economic uh, security outcomes, security uh, outcomes uh, on the African continent. She always made it about uh, what would accrue to the benefit of Americans. We don't always tell that story well. When I uh, was the U.S. ambassador uh, to South Africa, I had the honor of helping to renegotiate uh, the African Growth and Opportunity Act. South Africa is the largest beneficiary of AGOA uh, on the continent. Even though 46 other African nations benefit, it's really overwhelmingly about South Africa. Every year, South Africa gets to import into the U.S. over 60,000 automobiles that are built in South Africa uh, under AGOA uh, for, for, for GM, for uh, Volkswagen, for Mercedes. But it's all this kind of um, beneficiary trade uh, program uh, that uh, was created some time back. Um, negotiating on AGOA, working closely with U.S. companies and understanding how uh, U.S. agriculture benefits uh, from outcomes uh, on the continent, uh, U.S. tech uh, benefits from outcomes, made it possible for me to have a kind of different perspective uh, on the uh, trade uh, versus aid paradigm uh, that many uh, Africaners have been arguing uh, about uh, for some time now. It's impossible to have a conversation about the U.S. and Africa without doing it in the context of um, uh, China's interventions and investments uh, on uh, the African continent over the last uh, 15 years, uh, really, where it's really become uh, pronounced. I remember being in um, uh, an African nation that I will not name. I was there for a trade ministerial uh, meeting where you have all these trade ministers from, from the continent, and we're meeting in a... Uh, a facility uh, that was designed uh, by the Chinese uh, government uh, for this African nation. Uh, and there was a power outage uh, in the middle of uh, the conference. And um, it took forever to get this thing back up. And at some point, I had to ask my, um, uh, my counterparts, like, what, what happened? And they're like, well, the instruction manual was all in Mandarin. And we had to go, literally, to get the Chinese engineers. I'm thinking, oh, this is, oh, wow. this is, not, this is not bode well <laughs> for the future. <laughs> but there is this new kind of comp competition that's occurring uh, on the continent. Uh, and I was excited to see the heads of state of Ghana, Tanzania, Zambia, not falling into the old Cold War uh, traps, but really talking about what this moment means for the agency of Africans themselves uh, and how they are working to get uh, the best deals on their minerals, uh, on all the you know, extractive industries and opportunities for job growth for young people uh, on a continent uh, that is the fastest growing continent in the world. Uh, it's exciting to see that change right. uh, of, 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 uh, of right. pace. I will tell you that right now, there's a, I have a little bit of heart sickness uh, about Africa, about South Africa in particular, because a few weeks ago, one of my great heroes uh, passed away. Uh, somebody who really shaped my organizing, my activism, and how I think about um, uh, power building uh, and uh, national and international advocacy. Uh, and that's Randall Robinson, who, yeah, who founded right. uh, Trans Africa. Okay. Extraordinary figure. I always tell, uh, when I speak to students, I always tell them, you know, deepest respect, before there was such a thing as the internet, some of us actually participated in a global movement for justice, uh, and we did it with mimeograph uh, machines, right? So I... Um, uh, the, the, but the passing of Randall Robinson uh, for me is kind of like this point of inflection where I'm, you know, I'm asking some really tough questions about what it meant to participate in the anti-apartheid movement uh, and, whether, and what the legacy means in the relationship between our civil society uh, and African uh, civil society at a moment when there's all of this fragility, fragility in all of our uh, democracies. Having served uh, in South Africa, it was difficult uh, to, to see some of the, uh, you know, some of the corruption uh, mm -hmm. that has seeped in. But I you know, always reminded young South Africans 
that for you know, the first 100, 150 years of American history, most of our institutions were profoundly corrupt and most of our elections were stolen <laughs> right up until the 1960 presidential contest <laughs> anyway. So, so there's, you know, there's, always, so, there, there's always hope and, um, uh, uh, forward, but, but you know, as, as I'm a radical optimist when it comes to Africa, but I remind myself all the time that all of Africa right now has a combined GDP that's about the equivalent of the uh, GDP of France. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, irrespective of the fact that they are um, uh, the engine that runs the world. None of our phones would work if not for the Colton coming up from the Congo where I was born. Uh, there are so many of those kinds of, of examples and uh, I'm confident in, in the young entrepreneurs and innovators uh, and activists that I've met all up and down the continent. I know they're gonna turn that around. No, thank you. Um, Last question before I go to the audience, and I do want quick questions, quick response, but my last question, what are you reading right now? What am I reading right now? God, I'm reading, I'm reading too many things right now. So I, um, I'm spending some time with um, the, the book uh, on uh, poverty uh, that's uh, written by uh, uh, Matthew Desmond, who is a, a Pulitzer uh, winner. Uh, the New York Times exerted uh, some, of, uh, uh, some of Desmond's a uh, new book, I think it's fantastic. Fantastic in that, um, at least uh, where I'm at, I'm about, I'm about halfway through the book, uh, and, and what I love about it is that he's not just uh, telling a story of deprivation, he's telling a story of power, right? He's saying, here's where we stand today, here's how we got here, here's uh, where, where labor force participation stood for women at X point, here's where it is right now, here's where labor density stood, here's the relationship between labor density and our ability to incentivize raises, et cetera, and, and, and building a vibrant middle class. He asked a lot of questions in there about the accumulation of power, who controls it, who has agency in this economy, what we do about it. I'm reading that. Uh, I'm, I'm rereading, um, for a little bit of light reading, I'm rereading Moby Dick right now because uh, okay. you're a Jamaican, so you're gonna appreciate that. You're yeah. a Jamaican scholar, so you're gonna appreciate this. <laughs> uh, I, I um, uh, have this like this affinity for C.L.R. James, who of yes, course wrote the right. definitive book about the, the Haitian Revolution. Right. But see, there's like this great story about C.L.R. James. He, he really wanted to be an American, he wanted to be in America, uh, and he overstayed uh, a, a research uh, a fellowship visa that he was out here in this country, he got scooped up put on Ellis Island. A lot of people don't understand that Ellis Island wasn't just a port of entry for folks. It was also a prison <laughs> if you were you know, in violation of, your, of, of immigration. CLR James was imprisoned on Ellis Island and he was trying to figure out how he could convince the American authorities that they should keep him here and that he was really fundamentally uh, in, uh, American. So he wrote a 200 page essay while he was on Ellis Island uh, about Moby Dick. Oh, uh, yeah. And oh. uh, about yeah. how Moby Dick was like the, the, the classic American novel because it demonstrated that American industry uh, was a counter to the imperialism of Europe, colonialism of Europe, and he talked about the different, the agency of the, the natives, the blacks, et cetera, who were on uh, the Pequod. And so reading C.L.R. James right now and reading that essay made me want to reread Moby Dick, so I'm also rereading Moby Dick. Look at that. Um, thank you, you sir. Asked. No, and that's fantastic. Now I'm gonna go reread that because um, we got spring break starts on Wednesday, so I can go reread that. Um, clearly, a lot of questions. I'm gonna do short questions, short response. I have to give because we always try to center the student. Is there a student that has a question? Okay, it's a quick question. Quick questions, quick answer. I'll, I'll take this question under one, uh, but, but I'm just asterisk. I know that uh, my former boss has to leave for, oh. uh, for something else soon, so I hope she gets the second She'll question. She'll get the second question. Even though I'm intimidated by getting a question from her. Okay. Please. Quick question. Um, how did your cultural background inspire your career and in, oh. in you as a person? Oh, wow, what a, what a fantastic question. So um, my, 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 my cultural background is just like this weird mishmash. So uh, you heard me say that I was born in the Congo, um, uh, and I actually had Congolese citizenship up until the age of 18. So uh, my parents are Haitian. Uh, my father uh, was a newly minted young lawyer uh, in Haiti at the same time that uh, Papa Doc Juvayer came into power. And my father had this foolish notion that there ought to be free and fair elections in Haiti. Uh, and he went and said that publicly. <laughs> and one day, I, I thought it was so funny. He, he would say this with a laugh. One day while he was in the bathtub in his home, he found himself at the business end of a shotgun. And he was told in no uncertain terms 
that if he continued organizing for democracy in Haiti, that his fate was sealed. Uh, he knew that this was real because my, my, uh, my mother's brother, his brother-in-law, had been disappeared prior to that. He knew this was a, a real threat. Fortunately for him, this coincided with a period when uh, Lumumba had come into power uh, in the Congo. He put out a call for French-speaking educators from throughout the African diaspora to come to Haiti uh, to educate the new generation of leaders because the French and the Belgian, Belgian educators had hightailed it out of the Congo. Uh, so my father uh, and 500 uh, Haitian educators and intellectuals and activists uh, were forced at the point of exile, but they had this option, to leave Haiti at the time, and they went uh, to the Congo and the region uh, and stayed throughout the 1960s, and I happened. Uh, so I was born uh, in the Congo. Uh, at some point uh, early on, when I was uh, still a wee little thing, we came uh, to the United States, uh, and I maintained my Congolese, I was born into Congolese citizenship, uh, maintained that, and in our home, my father always had Haitian exiles, African exiles, activists from the Caribbean diaspora in our home, having all kinds of dynamic conversations uh, about uh, the moment, Pan-Africanism, uh, and US politics. Uh, and all of that always kind of informed my interest uh, and my ambitions, both on uh, the creative side and on the political side. Uh, so it always seemed natural uh, to me uh, to be involved in some fashion in uh, public service. Uh, and I had the good fortune to come up at a time in New York where um, uh, New York was basically a bre New York was a breeding ground uh, for activism, for policy making. Uh, I think that uh, throughout the 70s, 80s, into the 90s, we had the smartest, brightest elected officials uh, in this town. And there was little that distinguished those uh, politicians from the activists who were outside their doors, outside their corridors, agitating and advocating. And for me, there was a seamlessness between those spaces, and I saw no contrast from being uh, in Lafayette Park, demonstrating uh, against the White House uh, in one moment, uh, and a few years later working in the Obama White House on the same issues that I had been demonstrating on. So that kind of fluidity uh, that comes, I think, from my culture uh, has always kind of informed my, my politics and policy making. That's fantastic. Thank you. So it's just to, to broaden it, one, one, more, one more issue wide, um, in terms of the current administration, in terms of cap work, I'm in despair about the issues of immigration. Representative Nadler's office is trying to help us get literally one woman doctor who is the head of the medical school in Kabul, the State Department won't give her a visa. But it's the Afghans, it's the Haitians, as you know, and now in New York City, it's the Venezuelans, and every single government level Whatever they say, and I know what some of them say, are putting blocks to people being able to come here, are putting div divisive between people here and already here. And I don't know if CAP is doing any work on this, but it's a matter of despair. Um, uh, share your, your dispiritedness uh, about it. Share your anger, and, 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 yes, uh, and, and, yes, and yes, we are. I, I can, I can. No, no, we'll get to you, sir. We'll get to you, sir. We'll get to you, sir. I promise you we'll get to you. I did, not, I did not know that your hand had been up for a while. I, prom I promise you we will. Um, so I, I'll, I'll say this, and I, I can say this out loud here because I've, I've, um, I've said it on television uh, before about, about this administration uh, that I, you know, I, um, in, in complete alignment and correspondence with them on so many fronts, not on immigration. I thought it was reprehensible that this administration continued uh, Trump policies on the use of um, the, the COVID restrictions, uh, if you will. Uh, I was stunned uh, uh, to see the abuses uh, from Border Patrol against uh, Haitians uh, in Del Rio. Uh, I went uh, to the border of Del Rio and confronted uh, those policies. Uh, I will tell you that it's astonishing uh, to hear from the Department of Homeland Security, uh, and I, I'll say this out loud too, because I, I, you know, I've said this before, I actually don't believe that DHS should exist in its current, uh, its current uh, form. I think there's something anti-democratic about the way uh, DHS was created and its continued uh, uh, construct I have a real problem with. But I think it's problematic that this DHS uh, is now uh, socializing and floating into the world the notion that the Biden administration may use family uh, detentions uh, as, a, as, a, as a policy uh, at the border. 
Uh, there's a phenomenal piece that was written by, uh, uh, in the Atlantic by a reporter named Kitten Dickerson, who did this like 18 month examination mm. of the Trump family detention uh, policy, what, ha how it, what happened, how it happened, and how good bureaucrats looked the other way. Mm. Uh, we are not gonna allow good bureaucrats to look the other way uh, in this moment, uh, Ruth, uh, and we'll continue to do like public agitation on this mm. and to work uh, with leadership uh, in uh, the House, like Congressman uh, Nadler, uh, and with all the groups who I think have the ability to build mm. credible uh, pressure around these issues. I am no longer saying um, you know, that, uh, you know, that we must immediately achieve comprehensive immigration reform, because it ain't happening. Right? That, is not, that is not the conversation to have. Having a sane and humane set of policies uh, at the border uh, is, the, is the immediate North Star that we need to be working towards. I understand the political challenge for Democrats at the border. There's a way that Republicans manage to combine um, law and order in our cities with law and order uh, at the border in ways that benefits them mm -hmm. politically, totally get that. But we know that uh, economically, we need a different, um, uh, different set of policies uh, at the border. Uh, and we also have to appreciate uh, that uh, those who are at the border, who are seeking am amnesty, who are seeking a different life, quite often are fleeing from violence uh, mm -hmm. that exists in their communities, whether it's Honduras, Mexico, et cetera, that exists precisely because of gun traffic from the U.S. Uh, into uh, those regions. And our inability to address that is having profound, profound consequences uh, for folks who we then treat in the most inhumane ways. I could say so much more uh, about this, I'll stop there, but the short answer is yes, we're, we're, we're working on this and we'll continue to work with you and anyone else that we can who are much smarter uh, than I could possibly be on this issue. Thank you. Yeah. Sir, and then we'll, we'll work our way back. I'm Michael Myers, president, oh, uh, president of the New York Civil Rights Coalition, former assistant natural director of the NAACP. My question to you is direct and short. What the hell happened to the racial integration movement and the free speech movement? Uh, for example, the NAACP used to be a, a, an integrated, racially integrated board of directors, and racially integrated policies. And as you know, the NAACP is no longer an integrated organization. So on, on, the, on the campuses, such as Stanford recently, people will not even listen to speakers of a different point of view. They want to shut them down and boycott them. So what the hell happened to free speech, the movement that black liberals so. urged and wanted. And all I get now when you go to college campuses is blacks who support black dorms, Asians who support Asian dorms, Hispanics who support Hispanic floors. And we don't have any opposition to racial idiocy coming from anybody in command at the presidential level, yeah. vice presidential level, Anywhere, even in New York, I'll, we got two Congress people can here. I, can I? Can I? And I haven't heard from like them. That? Oh, you know, I'm sure. I'm in sure. opposition to black separatism and nationalism. So, so Michael, let me, let me thank you, thank you, thank you for the question and the provocation that's 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 in the question. I think there are two different. There, there are two think two very different things that you just raised. There's one issue. Uh, one is integration, and the other is free speech. These are not the same issue at all. You want to be careful not to conflate the two. Uh, on integration, I, I totally get and support on uh, the desire to have affinity groups completely support that, particularly since as somebody who, um, you know, uh, <laughs> I remember going through school without any affinity groups. <laughs> and it was brutal. Uh, and going through society and institutions without affinity groups was brutal. So I, I recognize the desire and the, and, and the, um, uh, uh, and the, the security uh, uh, that is made possible as a consequence of affinity groups. So I want to be careful and not knock in. That's different. I, and let me finish, Michael. Let me finish. That's Michael, I don't want, look, Michael, you and I could probably stand up here and do this all day, but please let me at least finish my thought because there are other folks who want to have an opportunity to speak. And I, and I knew that uh, my use of the word security would, would be one that would kind of like animate you. Um, but I want to make that, hold that as distinct from this question of free speech. I share your concern uh, about what's happening with free speech. There was a, you, you mentioned Stanford, there was an op-ed. Was it, was it in the Times or Wall Street Journal or Washington Post? It was Times, Times yeah. just yesterday by a law student uh, in Stanford who expressed all kinds of concern about 
the lack of pluralistic debate that's available to her uh, and her uh, classmates today. It's really problematic. Let me give you an example of a conversation that I had in Chicago recently that was just troubling to me, but I think speaks to, I think gets at the answer of what happened, right? So I, I, I went to the University of Chicago, uh, did a talk uh, with graduate, uh, graduate students, uh, and during the course of the conversation, I talked, uh, this was during the Build Back, uh, the Build Back Better, is that what we're called? Build Back Together, Build Back Better uh, Bill. And we were talking about what was happening, why we were not able to get it across the finish line, uh, and the challenge from, oh, West Virginia and Arizona. And I, and I said in the conversation, in response to a question from a graduate student, I said, you know, it's interesting. Organizing was different when I was, com when I was coming up. I said, I remember the first time that I went door to door uh, in West Virginia. Uh, it was 1988, I was working on Jesse Jackson's presidential campaign, and I went canvassing in West Virginia. I was knocking on doors of people who didn't look anything like me and who had not seen anyone like me knocking on their door in 1988. And there were times where I was greeted uh, with hostility, but there were other times when I was expecting hostility and people said to me things like, well, you know, I've never voted for a black person before and I'm not comfortable, they would say that to me, I'm not comfortable with black people. However, you're making some good arguments here uh, about education, about rights, about what uh, farmers need, and your guy, Reverend Jackson at the time, uh, is uniting our coal workers uh, with the farmers, and so I'm voting for your guy. So it was an interesting experience for me to have as a very, very young black person knocking on doors in West Virginia at the time, and I said to the audience then, I wanna contrast that with what I'm seeing right now. We understand that Senator Manchin not supporting this bill, but I don't see us having conversations with West Virginians. Instead, I see us all over social media kind of making some disturbing arguments about folk that we've never been in direct engagement with. The only ones of my friends I see going in, into West Virginia are going to demonstrate at Joe Manchin's yacht. They're not actually going door to door and having conversations with West Virginians about rural health care, what's in this bill, what's in it for them, and being informed by that. And after I said that, a young person in the room, to your point about security, set, stood up and said, appreciate what you said, a lot of what you said I respect and recognize, but I have a problem with the fact that you are asking some of us um, to go into places where we're not safe. And I said, how did I do that? And this person said, well, as a non-binary non person, I'm not comfortable going and having conversations with people who don't think that I should exist. And I had to pause and say, deepest respect, you're talking to a black man who was knocking on doors in West Virginia in 1988, <laughs> okay? Like, we have to get out of our own skins if we have any, abil if we have any hope of building um, uh, majority, governance that's multiracial, pluralistic, and, and, and has an orientation towards a set of values uh, that we think will hold uh, our nation, our people, our communities uh, together. I feel very strongly about that. Even though I am an unapologetic progressive, uh, I understand that I have to be discomforted with my notions and the set of assumptions that uh, I make about policy direction, et cetera. And I hope that we're at a point now where a lot of young people, like my, you know, I have a daughter who's a junior in college, a son who just graduated from university. My son, who's a creative artist, said that he was silent uh, in his, he, he went to um, uh, NYU, Tisch, uh, and he said, and he's, he is a progressive young man. He was silent uh, in, uh, his, in most of the conversations in class because he felt as if there was not a space ever to interrogate any assumptions made uh, and, and that's not why he thought uh, higher education existed. So I think increasingly we're seeing young people who are proudly, um, who, you know, proudly values centered, but who are comforted with uh, interrogating uh, themselves, uh, direction in a way that's gonna benefit us all uh, in the end. Uh, your question on uh, integration, I appreciate. Uh, I feel as if, um, there is a good deal more uh, integration and aspiration towards integration in civil rights organizations that I participate with uh, than I see in, I don't know, the US Chamber of Commerce, <laughs> but you know, I'll just, <laughs> just say it from my limited experience. Thank you, sir. Yes, and then. I have a quick question. Uh, do Democrats take minorities for granted? And the second question is, uh, is a matter of strategy and tactics. Uh, 
in politics, uh, if the enemy is strong, you ignore the enemy. When the enemy, uh, when the enemy is weak, you ignore the enemy. When the enemy is strong, you attack the enemy. So the timing of the Trump at this point, would it have, would it have been in a, a different way it could be handled? Uh, you know, look, so I'll, on your first question on whether or not Democrats take minorities for granted, uh, it is a, uh, you know, it is a, uh, it's a, it's a question one hears all the time uh, in politics uh, in uh, the U.S. Uh, I would, I come at it in, from a very, very, very different perspective. Uh, I think that from the passage of the Civil Rights Act uh, in uh, 1964, uh, in the decades since, we have seen a sea change uh, in American politics, uh, and there is one political party uh, that has been expansionist uh, in its inclusion, even though it has um, uh, been far uh, from perfect uh, on civil rights uh, issues. Uh, but the party of the Dixocrats uh, has evolved uh, into a party following the Mississippi uh, freedom intervention of Fannie Lou Hamer and others who upended the Democratic Party uh, at the Chicago Convention, uh, right. it was, uh, in 1968. Right. Uh, following that and rules changes in the party, uh, we've seen an expansionist party that has been inclusive of not just minorities as voters, uh, but minorities as real agents of leadership uh, in uh, the party from the local level uh, all the way up to uh, the national uh, level. We've seen that uh, in the party. Conversely, uh, on the other side, not only have we not seen, and I, I'm, I hesitate to use the word minority, but I'm gonna use it because that's the, the question you posed me. Not only have we seen a lack of uh, inclusion, participation, engagement with uh, uh, issues that are central uh, to uh, th those constituencies and those communities from the Republican Party, we have seen a lack of engagement at the level of leadership with women uh, in uh, the ranks of Republican leadership. If you look at the women who are in Congress, for instance, uh, women in the Senate, women in, in uh, the House, it's disproportionately uh, in one uh, political party. It's starting to change uh, a bit, uh, but even you know, from uh, whether you're talking about minorities, talking about women, there has not been this expansionist notion in the Republican Party about the American enterprise, who's included in agency, in power, uh, or not. I do not believe that the Democratic Party writ large uh, takes for granted or takes advantage of uh, minorities. I do believe that uh, people of color have had insignif uh, insufficient power and agency in American politics, period, period, irrespective of their uh, party uh, affinity. Uh, I do think uh, that um, uh, even the election of black and brown members of Congress, even a black president, doesn't really speak to uh, agency at the level of local control of resources uh, that uh, really govern uh, political messaging, the political uh, ecosystem uh, in a way that directly uh, benefits community. It's changed, uh, it's evolved, uh, and uh, I think that's gonna continue to transform. There's a, there's a question that people should be putting, not to Democrats, but to Republicans, about what they're doing uh, in order to build a more uh, inclusive, uh, expansive notion uh, of their party uh, and the American democratic experiment. Okay, can we go to, it, did you have a question? And, and no, I'm not, I'm not answering the question on Trump, because oh. I, you know, I'm, because. Well, yeah, let I don't, me. You know, I, don't, I, don't know who the I don't know who the enemy is uh, in that question, and I, and I will say that we are a 50-50 nation. Like, like split uh, uh, evenly. There are probably seven or uh, six states that are gonna decide the outcome of the presidential election in 2024, six states that are gonna decide uh, whether or not uh, Congressman Nadler is gonna be in the majority uh, again, and, what, you know, and Hakeem Jeffries has the, the gavel, et cetera. Six states are gonna decide uh, all of that. Otherwise, we are split uh, down uh, the middle uh, in this nation. I don't know who the enemy is. I do know that I, ha I have to personally take up my, my politics as a citizen and as an institutional leader in a way that's gonna uh, create space uh, to persuade others uh, to the strength of our uh, arguments uh, and uh, the value for their families and their communities of the kind of policies that we're trying to enact uh, on healthcare, on uh, the rights uh, of workers, 
uh, and the space that we're creating uh, for um, those who don't look like us uh, in, our, in our society. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Ambassador, can I take us back to the beginning of the conversation on the uh, difficulty to separate law from politics in public policy? What would you make of defense motions, now that the indictment has been um, uh, offered up, to dismiss all of the charges in the indictment based on malicious prosecution and abuse of discretion theories, and those based on the district attorney's express personal vendetta against the defendant, which was now, announced and so expressed during the campaign in writing and orally. So, mm -hmm. so the great thing about America uh, is that, um, shockingly, shockingly enough, uh, the vast majority of Americans are able to make a distinction between um, the, uh, the rhetoric of political campaigns uh, and the authority that one exercises uh, when you're a member of Congress, a district attorney, uh, the President of the United States. It's clear to some of us that Donald Trump was unable to make that distinction when he uh, occupied uh, the White House and when he tried to uh, impose his will uh, on the Attorney General uh, and others uh, in uh, his government. But fortunately, the vast majority of Americans were able to make the distinction between campaigns uh, and uh, governance. I'm at a disadvantage because I arrived here uh, following the articulation of uh, the, uh, the, the, the measures uh, in the indictment. Right. So I literally don't know what, um, uh, what the DA uh, disclosed, and I don't know what the counter arguments have since been uh, from uh, the defense attorneys, but the other great thing about America is that they're all going to have, an, uh, you know, many, many months to litigate it all <laughs> and to uh, uh, and to get. Uh, I think that I, I think it's fair to say that Donald Trump is uh, going to get a, a, a fairer opportunity for justice than oh, I don't know, like the Central Park Five kids uh, yeah. that he uh, pilloried yeah, uh, some decades ago. That's that's absolutely right. Yes. Um, and we will make this, is it, what's the second to last question called? The penultimate question? Is that, did I use that word right? There you go. I shall try. Thank you. Yeah. Is there efficacy to pull back, as you did earlier, about the discussion of public education and defunding to speak of publics, public health, public housing, and, and, or is that too sophisticated? That is my question. No, I, I wish you would say a little bit more about by, by what you mean, because I think you're you're, you're that there to be important. is a defunding, if you will, to use the nomenclature, of these public spaces, whether it's a billionaire and town halls or all the publics, and people feel as though, well, I don't have a child in a school, so I'm not going to concern myself, or I'm not using Medicare, even though millions will fall off, or I'm not a NYCHA. But if we look at it cohesively and in the aggregate, everybody has something. Yeah, everyone, everyone's got a stake, right? So that's the that's the thing that uh, that we've uh, lost a sense of. You ask me what I'm what I'm reading these days, and there's a thing that is never very very far away from uh, top of the file. Uh, it's never I never put this this little book uh, on my bookshelf. It's always sitting on the corner of my desk. Uh, it's um, uh, uh, Thomas Paine's little yeah. uh, little little little, little yeah. essay. Yeah. His little essay. Uh, and it's interesting when you go back and you read uh, Thomas Paine and you think about how uh, his, his notion of access and participation of the citizenry, there's like a, you know, somewhere very early on in the, in, in the essay where Thomas Paine kind of unpacks the evolution of governance, where we all used to live in these little, you know, these little farm villages, these little farm towns, and you know, representation was immediate, where you knew what your, the stake was that, that you were holding, and you appreciated what your uh, direct vote and influence meant, but now we've evolved into this space where we are all very, very far away from the centers of power, and so we have to send Carolyn Maloney and Jerry Nadler and trust that they're going to carry uh, our, um, uh, our intention uh, into uh, the rooms where uh, they are uh, debating. But boy, we really made it better make sure that we never lose hold of that umbilical cord between ourselves uh, and Congressman Nadler and, co and Congressmember uh, Maloney, because if we do, that's going to be the death of us all and the death of this thing that we're in. I think that we're at that point where um, the umbilical uh, is, uh, is, has been severed uh, in many ways, and, and there aren't enough. Uh, there isn't a sense of, uh, of, stake, of stakeholdership uh, at all. One of the things that I love uh, during uh, and and, and uh, the two representatives here, who I more than admire, actually I love these two people. Uh, they will they will forgive me for making reference to uh, 
um, uh, a political contest that they were recently uh, engaged in. I thought they both uh, handled it with uh, grace and mag magnanimity. But one of the great things about hearing a conversation between Carolyn Maloney and Jerry Nadler doing that contest is they were able to have thoughtful engagement and debate, not just on um, what was occurring at the border and federal policy and what it meant to, to, to do the right thing there, but they were also able to take the conversation to the level of whether or not the dilapidated church on 86th Street and Amsterdam Avenue uh, should get uh, a particular kind of uh, landmark designation and what that would mean for uh, the commercial footprint in the community, what it would mean for the vibrancy of certain kind of activity, right? So they were able to always, hold, they, both of them have always been able to hold on to that sense of the umbilical that tethers them to local stakeholdership. Right now, we have too many people who are sitting in Washington, D.C., who are performing to the next thing that can go viral uh, on social media. They're not actually uh, taking into consideration the, the 600,000 disparate folks that they are charged uh, with meaningfully uh, and thoughtfully uh, representing. So that umbilical cord is being severed uh, by technology that should bring us closer, that's bringing us uh, further apart. And on this question of the publics and the public square, unfortunately, the public square is no longer a material thing. It is now a virtual thing. Uh, and so it's difficult to have a conversation about um, the publics uh, in rural health care in West Virginia, right, and what our stakeholdership is ought to look like there, or the fact that, you know, uh, the governor of North Carolina just expanded uh, Medicaid in his state, and that's going to allow... Uh, a dozen rural hospitals to stay open uh, in, in a way that they would not have before. And uh, appreciating the stakeholdership that exists between our metro centers and rural centers on public health care, on public education, et cetera, et cetera, is something that we are, um, that's becoming a little deteriorated and disjointed uh, that I and many others are working every single day uh, to reconstitute uh, and to uh, do it in a way that, t that tethers through the, the $1.6 trillion uh, in investments that are coming down to tether the local to the uh, federal in a way that ladders up to a different narrative about public stakeholdership. Sorry to give you such a, you know, uh, well, a long-winded response there, but I wanted well, to... Well, it's clear that I will not learn what I need to learn on TikTok, I guess. Is that is the key? <laughs> um, Last question, and you will be our last, I, I gotta go to this last question here, and you will be our last question before uh, we have uh, wine and cheese upstairs. Um, so just before, because I'm gonna forget to tell you that in a second, but uh, yes, please. Oh, hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm, a, I'm an alumni here, <laughs> sorry. Um, um, so I wanted to ask you, right, um, so now that we understand that Donald Trump has been indicted on the hush money and the uh, falsifying business records, um, I wanted to ask you, what do you think, like, how do you, will that have any effect on the DOJ um, potentially bringing um, formal charges against Donald Trump for the insurrection? And why has even, even despite all the evidence that the January 6th committee has found, why is there taking like so long to actually indict that's him a, on a that's actual a that's insurrection? a that's a that's a question that Congressman Nadler is better positioned to respond <laughs> to than me. That's, I'd love to I'd love to put our congressman on the spot uh, on that if I could. <laughs> Well, first of all, first of all, the fact that uh, Donald Trump was indicted on 34 felony counts uh, based on violating state law has no impact whatsoever on what the feds do. Uh, even if some of the federal uh, 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 crimes may be premised on the same facts. So that's, that's the first thing. Second thing, why is it taking so long for the, for the feds to, uh, do, to do it? That I don't know. A lot of people have asked the question, uh, uh, when Michael Cohen was convicted um, of, of, uh, of, uh, of a federal crime for falsifying business records and uh, paying hush money on behalf of Donald Trump, and he said it was on behalf of Donald Trump, why Donald Trump wasn't immediately indicted by the uh, well, we do know why he wasn't indicted immediately by the feds, because it was his Justice Department, which was a corrupt Justice Department, that was handling it. What I don't understand 
is why they didn't indict him the day after Biden took over, um, because that Justice Department is a decent Justice Department. Now, he may yet be indicted. I mean, we know that uh, uh, Smith, the special prosecutor, is investigating Mar-a-Lago, and he is probably in, he's investigating the insurrection. He may also be investigating this. We don't know. The, um, the, w one of the things that uh, um, we appreciated the, the agitation of both these members of Congress around the uh, investigations following January 6th, following what happened uh, in uh, the states, uh, and none of us can predetermine outcomes of any of these uh, investigations, though it seems clear that there were uh, uh, violations committed by those around the president and by uh, the president uh, himself. One thing that I'll say that has confounded me is why it took two years to appoint a special prosecutor. <laughs> like, why that didn't happen uh, from day one is something that has uh, vexed me endlessly. So I think the congressman answered uh, better than I, uh, I could. I just want to end by thanking you all for your attentiveness, your attentiveness, uh, your thoughtful uh, questions, the opportunity to be uh, in your company. But I want to especially thank my brother, uh, Basil, for inviting me, for holding us all uh, in uh, community here. And I want to note, as he did in the beginning, that he and I met uh, in the middle of a campaign when we were supposed to be on opposing sides. Uh, and we're, we're representing uh, two candidates who were seen as being uh, from different parts of the ideological spectrum in the Democratic Party, and yet we became fast friends uh, in that moment and have held on uh, to that relationship for, for decades. And I kind of use that uh, right now uh, as a kind of guidepost for how to think about how to conduct uh, my other political um, uh, fights. So uh, thank you. Thank you, brother. And thank you, Congressman Nadler, Congresswoman Maloney. Thank you so much for being here. And Joyce Miller, I had to uh, say hello to you. She is an adjunct for us here, among many other things, but she teaches our intro uh, uh, public policy course. Of, and she's Congressman Nadler's wife. Uh, uh, and so thank you so much for being here. Thank you all for being here. Please uh, give us a, a you know,